you had a, a good grounding uh, from Anders uh, on John Boyd the Man. Um, but what Ian, I think, will be able to help us with is understanding, as his title shows, what uh, John Boyd's thinking means for small states, which is the main focus of our course. So with that, I'll say, Ian, thank you for coming and the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. Good, yes, it's afternoon. I'm still trying to figure out what time it is. Um, but good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am definitely excited to be here um, in person. Since the first time we did this, it was all virtual and you know we were all living out of our houses and just kind of bouncing off the walls. So, uh, and this is also just talking, this is my our, our team's first visit over to Sweden. It was something that was on our travel agenda actually back in 2020 before COVID locked everything down. And we were really, we were really itching to get back out there. So this, the whole invitation for us to come here to be part of the military leaders uh, conference here and be able to talk to you directly. It's just great for a lot of reasons. And um, I, I, am, I do kind of get excited and become a fast talker. Um, so you're all gonna reel me back, but if I start getting, getting excited, it's partly, I, I love, I'm very interested in the subject matter. I think it's very applicable today. And in fact, when I was sending emails some additional links, I realized that some of the things I'm gonna cover here, uh, I'm not claiming to like to see the future or read any tea leaves, but I was looking back to my notes from last year and I, I thought the things we're seeing now in Ukraine take some of the threads that we're gonna talk about here and they just, they, they, they crank it up exponentially. So I think the timing of this class is actually very fortuitous. I think the subject matter is fortuitous. Um, maybe fortuitous isn't the right word because obviously what's going on in Ukraine is a big tragedy, but there's a lot that can be learned from it. And part of why I'm interested in coming here and talking to this, and I think putting it in the context of Ukraine, um, I'm sure you've probably had discussions here about what's going on there and what we can learn from it. We have, we have focused very heavily on that as well from our end uh, at Marine Corps University and in the Krulak Center because, uh, you know, the war is a tragedy and it would have been much better if nothing had happened, but it's happening. So we can either not look at it and just sort of hope it goes away or as military professionals, we can pull every possible lesson we can get from that because that is free knowledge for us. And uh, if other people are, are sort of spending lives and treasure to get that knowledge, we better be learning from that as a as a learning as military professionals. Um, okay, so the way I structured this, it's it's supposed to be sort of a direct jumping off from the grounding of void that you got in the previous class. And so how this is going to kind of go is I'm I'm going to I'm going to take some of that, especially some of the comments on how John Boyd and how maneuver warfare can apply to Swedish concepts of maneuver warfare in your own doctrine. And then I'm going to pull out a couple of things that um, that I think really are are part of the part of the engine that drives Boyd's ideas. There's a couple of things that he talks about again and again and again in his presentations. And I found in my own research some so there's sort of two big concepts we'll talk about that a lot of the writing about Boyd it, it sort of doesn't really make it in there. Um, and I don't really have a great explanation for why, but there are some recurring themes that I think really capture um, what he was what he was trying to get at as the most important. So we're going to go through those, and then I have some case studies to talk about these different things in the context of other nations, the other you know small states that had comparatively smaller air forces in contrast to the adversary that they were going up against at their place in time, and how they use some of these threads. To, uh, to achieve a, a favorable decision on the battlefield for them. Um, and actually the last couple of case studies, I almost thought about scratching them out because I thought with everything going on in Ukraine, they were sort of overtaken by events. I, I'm gonna leave them in there, but I'm gonna kind of probably get through them a little more quickly so we can get into uh, what's going on in Ukraine because I think that, and I'm gonna show you some new things that are not on my original slides because I think that really Again, what we're seeing, it really encapsulates a lot of these things. And I like, I could not have scripted it to, to more better encapsulate what I talked about a year ago. Okay, so these are some of the concepts. Before I do that, I'm gonna do the, I'm gonna try and do the bridge from your last Boyd class and how Boyd applies to Swedish concepts in maneuver warfare, and then start talking about these. Um, so I think it's in one of the last few slides of your, your last class where, um, there was a comment about Boyd in Sweden, 
and how Swedish maneuver warfare is based on effectively influencing, splitting, cutting off, or fighting an opponent based on a number of interacting uh, interacting factors. And so the one of the first threads I'm going to pull out, and I highlighted it in my copy of that, is the influencing piece, right? That is that's that's not a kinetic action. That's something that's more nebulous and non-kinetic. That's a key point. When I first read that, I expand. I pulled that out last year, and it's definitely more applicable this time around. So then, uh, going on talking about DGO twenty, um, talking about maneuver thinking based on indirect method and initiative, constant conceptual physical maneuver in all domains, creating dilemmas for the opponent. But again, I highlighted it: the organization, or sorry, the opponent's organization and their morale and other cohesive factors are more important goals than the armed forces themselves. Um, okay, so, and then these are the things we're gonna kind of layer on top of that, that I think that I think nests really well. Um, so, but before we go into that, um, the aspects of boy that I think are applicable here are, um, so actually going back to that opponent's organization, morale, other cohesive factors. The implication there is you want to make it worse for them for all of those factors and you want to make it better for you so you want to be cohesive you want to have a higher tempo um, you want to have higher morale you want to have better organization for all of the parts of your your group there um, and you want to you want to create a contrast between those so that you have as much advantage in that contrast as possible um, so how do you do that because um, I, it probably came out a little bit in some of the Boyd material in the previous slides, but when Boyd or when uh, when Marine Corps Maneuver Warfare Doctrine kind of starts building up its head of steam, it almost seems like you need to be like a mind reader or uh, some sort of supernatural being to achieve the level of cohesion and organization that it takes to execute those concepts. Um, and, you know, like how, how do we do that, right? We all know we're fallible human beings. We all have our own weaknesses. Sometimes we communicate terribly. How do we become like this sort of super being that executes this super, super construct? Well, there were a couple of things Boyd said that how you could get there from here. And they're really not complicated. It's just you have to do them and you have to build them. And it takes investment on the side of you as an individual and on the part of your organization to build those things effectively so that you can become that super being executing that super, super doctrine. Um, so there's sort of two things that he, uh, well, let's call it two and a half things that he uh, that he, he 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 talks about. The first one is the that first bullet up there, which is I'm, I don't think I've ever pronounced it properly in my whole life, but fingerspitzen Gefühl, which is a German term that literally means fingertip feeling, and what it just de it's describing the intuitive ability to look at a situation, immediately grasp the essentials, and then rapidly act. Um, sort of the, the coup d'oeil that, um, again, I'm not saying that right either, but the coup d'oeil that uh, Klaus Witz talks about for those, those great captains. Um, so, uh, how does one, but, so how does one develop this, this intuitive feeling that's like automatic? I see it, I know what to do, and I just do it. Well, Boyd said that you can, you can build this, right? If you're doing, you can build this in yourself and your own people by giving yourself and your own people constant and repeated hands-on experience under a variety of conditions so that you can build a repertoire of automatic responses and you you inculcate automatic decision making as a habit you just you just do it it's it's muscle it's muscle memory for your brain essentially um, the other thing that you need to to execute the super doctrine and to effectively do finger spits and get fuel is trust and um I don't, I don't know if, uh, if any of the, the leaders forms things were piped in here this morning or not, no, but um, when I was sitting there, they talk about trust a lot, about how, how, we're, you know, how we're getting ready for 21st century warfare with all these emerging technologies and um, how to you know, reorganize it, reorganizing ourselves for larger formations that's going to require more command and control and it's going to require more, it's going to require more capable people in terms of quantities and we're going to have to trust those larger numbers of people to go do these things with these larger formations. Um, but I was really glad they said that because uh, I, to me, this is one, if this is possibly the core point of everything that underlies the rest of Boyd's theory of warfare is trust, is, um, is being able to know that the people who are outside of your line of sight will go do the thing you want them to do. How they do it is kind of irrelevant, but you know that 
if you ask someone to uh, to march in that direction, they'll march in that direction. And uh, a little bit of a tangent here, but uh, one of the things from Ukraine that has really struck me in the contrast between performance of the Ukrainian military and the Russian military, to me as a as a someone who's looked the boy a while, trust is what makes it works on the Ukrainian side, at, at least as I'm looking at it. And the utter lack of trust on the Russian side is a large part of why they have been so inept at getting things done when they have larger numbers of forces, when they have larger amounts of equipment, some of their equipment is a lot more modern. Um, it to me, it boils down to the, uh, the, the Ukrainian leadership, Ukrainian military senior leadership, all the way down to, you know, the corporals and the, uh, you know, the, the privates who are out there on the battlefield, they're trusted to go, to go fight and go and go do what they need to do. Um, and and they really need to do that because they don't have a huge number of people and they and in some sense there's no choice right um you have to trust people outside your line of sight because you just don't have enough people to like to look at and manage you have to you have to trust they're going to do stuff when you can't see them because you don't have enough people to be everywhere i contrast that on the russian side where uh I, all these pictures of you know you got putin and a couple of his generals to me uh he only trusts the people he can see like in the same room with him, which is partly why those people are the ones going to the front lines on the battlefield in Russia and they keep dying. Um, because between those generals and the troops on the ground, he trusts absolutely, there is no trust at all from him to anybody else throughout that chain of command to go execute what he wants to do. Um, and if you kind of reverse that direction, I think a large part of the failures of the Russian military and the Russian intelligence is um, because they knew Putin didn't trust them. And they also know that if Putin doesn't trust you or like you, you have bad habits of accidentally falling out of four story windows to your death or accidentally stumbling onto radioactive material or poison. Um, so you don't want that to happen to you because he doesn't trust you. Um, so you're gonna tell him things that make him like you, whether or not they're true. Um, and if you do that at every echelon, you come up with this hollow military, which is what we're seeing the Russians are. They're a hollow military down to the point of, you know, Nobody trusted the troops to tell them they were going to go to war. So what do the what do the troops do? They sell their gas, right, to get booze. They sell their parts on the black market. And uh, if you really thought you were going to go to war and your life might depend on those gas and those parts, maybe you would have kept those. But they didn't think they were because nobody trusted them with that knowledge, that basic knowledge that would have let you prepare a little bit better for war. Okay, long tangent on trust. But the point is, I think this is this is really the if it's not the whole engine it's like a keep spark plug in the engine for what drives boys theories for it so uh trust right trust is also something like fixer finger spitzing you feel you can develop you can build and they actually talked about it this morning in the leader symposium um you can't just like expect you can't just throw people on the battlefield and if you have not built a habit of trust you, that's not going to come at the last minute you have to build that over time you your subordinates have to see that you trust them um and you have to see that they trust you. It's a, it's a, it's an exchange. So, but you build that trust the same way you build finger spitzing you fuel, which is through variety of different experiences, exposing them to different things in training and education, and just you know you constantly put people in different situations. They, you see what they do, and you know you see that they can execute under different situations. You start to trust them to do that. Conversely. They, they trust you to not put them into bad situations that might be wasteful of lives or treasure. And you just, it seems simple, but you, you take that and you build that habit of two-way trust over and over and over and over again. Um, so uh, also through that exposure process, it lets you observe the strengths and weaknesses of individual and unit finger spitzing you fuel. And then, like I said, you can use that knowledge to build and direct your teams in ways that make all of your collective and individual abilities complement each other. Um, what I mean by this is like knowing the strengths and weaknesses. If you have sort of maybe a, like a weaker tactical leader, you're not going to put them in a situation where they're going to fail because you've built that experience. You've observed them. Um, you'll put them somewhere where they can be useful, but not set up to fail. Conversely, they will trust you not to just throw them away in some fruit, you know, some pointless mission that you know you can't accomplish. Your leader knows you can't accomplish. But they have you do it anyway. Um, so it's a, it's a it's managing your people based on what they can and can't do. That builds trust as well. So the end result of all of this is that you get an organization trained and educated, 
to achieve the objectives given to them by their leaders, but they're also free to use their own individual and unit finger spitching good fuel to choose from that repository of experience that you have built up in them in the past. And, uh, and this creates an organization, a cohesive organization that is almost like a living organism. And in fact, Boyd described this, this organization like a family to the point where like, you know, uh, if you know your brother and sister and your parents, like, you know, you know what's gonna make your brother mad, you know what you're, you know, you know what's going to get you in trouble with your parents, um, or, or conversely, you know, mom or dad comes home from a bad day at work. They don't have to say anything. You just know because you've been through, you've been with them through so many different um, situations. You, you know, without having to to ask. Really, this builds implicit communication that lets you execute the higher tempo of that super doctrine, the super concept of newer warfare, um, by allowing you to communicate implicitly because you've built that that trust that uh, um, over, over time um, and through lots of different exposure to each other. Uh, okay, so you build that on your side with your um, giving yourself better fin finger spitching you fuel and, and building trust in your own subordinates. And then, uh, like I said the, or earlier on, you wanna create a, a delta, you wanna create a difference, as much a difference between your, your goodness, your super organization on this side, you want to degrade that in your opponent. So how do you do that? Um, and this is where we get back into sort of more of the uh, sort of the military history study of Boyd's theory, which is you looking through history, the things that uh, that let you undermine the adversary and undermine their trust, undermine their finger stitching good deal abilities is you're looking at multiple thrusts and mismatches. Um, you're trying some things you're doing are real. Some things you're doing are fake. You want to keep them confused. You want to keep them off balance. And um, to the point of the uh, one of those first highlighted comments about the morale the organization, you direct those thrusts against the those non those intangible things that let your opponent's organization work together. So it's not so much killing every tank on the battlefield, but if you have ways to isolate the different units there, reduce their ability to communicate, make them cold, make them miserable. Um, if you have some some personal knowledge of an enemy commander that you can use to put in front of the troops and drive a wedge between that commander and the troops that breaks trust, that breaks down their ability to operate as a cohesive group without you having to, to sling a single missile toward them. Um, and you, the point is you, you continue doing this until they are broken down into small, um, incoherent, uncohesive groups that even if they still have all of their weapons and all their vehicles, if you're able to break down those intangibles, you've isolated them and made them ineffective against you. Uh, let's see if I still have, yes, still have this one, this one in there. So a lot of the, how you, how we translate from those two things, how Boyd sort of codified those two things was, this is directly from your class, I believe. It's the big O, it's the orientation and the whole OODA loop process, which is really, it's a encapsulation of, that whole process of building the building that stuff within your team, um, and it's based on uh, it's based on the different factors that are in there, um, but it's it's leveraging all these different factors in the context of finger bits and fuel and trust, and in the context of building those habit patterns, understanding those linkages over and over and over again um, under lots of different conditions until you have all kinds of new unique connections that make this part of your organization really really strong um, and then having made that this now shapes everything that your organization does and uh the sort of big takeaway for me from this is that i've sort of said it at all of these steps you can build this right just like you build finger spitching good fuel just like you build decision making habit patterns just like you build trust you build this you you have agency to make this and the important thing is that uh you have to build this before the fight ever comes because it is it is a a long iterative process to put all those different connections together um i think one of the common misinterpretations and i know on the marine corps side of the orientation is it's like i look at something and then i orient on it and the implication is it's some sort of instantaneous higher analysis of the thing but it's in real time an aspect of orientation is in real time but building your orientation you should be doing that um, consciously from the moment you put on the uniform, knowing that 
every habit, every bit of knowledge that you learn will feed into this to make it better someday. Um, and there are parts of this which actually you're building through your entire life, right? Like you, let's take, he uses the term genetic heritage, which is kind of a, it's probably an older term, but the point is like, you're born with certain things that your body can do, right? You inherit certain attributes. Um, some things you can't control, you know, whether you're tall or short or, you know, blue eyes or, or brown hair or what have you, but some things you can control. You can make your body stronger, right? You know, you, you have agency over that. So you can build that part of the orientation for yourself. You can do that for your troops, right? Do a good PT program, um, expose their bodies to different physical conditions so that their bodies become, you know, more resilient. You, you've controlled that part of genetic heritage for that whatever, whatever they were born with, you've made it better in the process of training and education and building towards this. Okay, so I won't believe um, that too much. And uh, actually, last piece on there, and I'm going to get to it kind of near the end of the case studies, but strategic narrative is something which um, unfortunately is one of the aspects of Boyd's ideas that really didn't sort of like like make it through the wash when it came time for even in the Marine Corps to turn his ideas into something understandable. And it's unfortunate because um, when he's talking about different levels of war and comparison, comparing like attrition warfare versus maneuver warfare, there's a, a level on top of that that he talks about and he calls it moral conflict, not moral in the sense of right and wrong, um, but moral in terms of the intangibles of conflict. And understand if you can understand and manipulate the intangibles, you can get much better effects at either the maneuver or the attrition level. And a huge part of that that he talks about is strategic narrative. And what that really boy, he called it uh, the grand ideal as a different term in his uh, in his, the lecture version of his presentation. You probably won't find that written down in a lot of the things that his even his closest friends would talk about with boy. You never hear you never hear the grand ideal. Um, I never heard the term until. I started doing some of the research on my own when I was doing my master's that sort of launched this whole thing. But everything I heard about Boyd was like maneuver warfare, OODA loop, um, you know, orientation. That's the important part of the OODA loop. But what the grand ideal is, is simply, we would call it almost information operations or information warfare today, but it's using messages, using narratives, using themes to help to act as weapons almost to help your cause. Um, and not just as weapons to go and degrade the adversary, although you can do that effectively. We're seeing that in Ukraine. I'm going to talk about that. Um, but an effective strategic narrative will make your own organization stronger. You know, it's, I, I can't remember where I used it, but it, it's an example as simple as, you know, back in World War II in the United States, there was like the Why We Fight series of, of movies that were shown in movie theaters. And, you know, it was, propaganda at a certain level, but the, it was strategic narrative. This is why we're fighting. We are fighting to preserve something that is good. They are fighting to destroy something and, and you know, impose a dark view on the world. That's strategic narrative. That's messaging. And, the, you know, the clarity of that messaging, the fact that we are fighting for this positive thing, that's what keeps your alliance close together. That's what, if there, if there are or, or nations on the fence who are, you know, wondering which side do we go to, you have a good strategic narrative, you make that choice a lot clearer, right? I'm the allies, I'm fighting to, you know, preserve um, self-determination and, you know, a, a free, uh, you know, free economy, free way of life. They're fighting to exterminate. If that's my strategic message and I'm a neutral third party, you know, which way am I going to go, right? If somebody comes knocking on my door asking which side I'm going to join. Um, maybe I don't join the side that's fighting for good, right? But maybe I at least don't join the side that's fighting for genocide and extermination. And that is now taking a possible enhancement to the, the bad guys, if you will, off the table. If they don't join the bad guys, that is one less power they can draw on for their own, uh, their own objectives. But we'll go into that uh, a little bit more in the case studies. Okay, so um, the case studies that I chose, and so this gets back to, you know, the air power question, which is what we started off with, right? That's what we're concerned with. So I looked at the, uh, the winter war between Finland and the Soviet Union right before World War II, looked at the Six-Day War uh, between the Israelis and pretty much all of their Arab neighbors in 1967. And then uh, I was looking for more modern examples and uh, talked about, you know, the rise of ISIS and uh, their extensive use of uh, really a, a sort of a unique combination of 
drones um, combined with a very strong strategic narrative campaign. And then this is what I almost scratched out, the nagorno karabakh war, because I, I thought that that had sort of encapsulated some of the things we saw with ISIS initially. Like we had sort of matured it more in nagorno karabakh And then Russia invaded Ukraine. And I almost want to throw that one away because everything I would have talked about there, it's it's cranked up to the, the next level in Ukraine. But I, I still want to leave it because I, I think there's a, there's a sort of a progression that you can see how something first came out on the battlefield in a very new um, nascent form. It matured a little bit, and now we're seeing it mature basically on, on larger state, state on state warfare. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to go into like the full histories of all these wars. I'm just going to go on some, uh, some broad outlines, but the things that jumped out to me of how these, Air forces of smaller states, but you know, relative to their adversaries, were nevertheless able to achieve successes on the battlefield to help achieve national objectives. Um, and what aspects of Boyd's thought I think are sort of applicable to each one. So, um, in the Winter War, I don't want to oversimplify, but you know, obviously the Soviet Union they had they had more stuff, they had more people, they had more aircraft, they had a much wider diversity of aircraft compared to the the Finnish Air Force. Um, the uh, uh, a lot of the um, you know Finland didn't have a lot of really uh, a lot of established airfields that they could draw on. So there's some geographic limitations. You know, different population base. They have fewer people they can put into the fight. So th there's a lot of disparities going on right there at the outset, which makes it look like you know Finland and then the Finnish Air, Air Force specifically not in a great position going into this. But um, looking at both sort of the military and the pol political leadership at the time, they did a, a pretty um, honest assessment of what their national strengths and weaknesses were. And they looked at turning those things that were potentially liabilities um, into different types of strength that could be applied judiciously against the Soviets. Um, another thing, another the differential between the size of the military budgets is a point I pulled out. And it's something we talk about in the Marine Corps a little bit, although we've gotten kind of lazy with a lot of the, the global war on terror money, um, which uh, I, I think made us stop thinking in a lot of ways, but austerity can breed innovation. It forces you to find creative ways of solving problems without just like throwing money or throwing lots of stuff at it until you, you know, and just overwhelm the problem with stuff. Um, so some of the things that the, uh, the Finnish Air Force and the Finnish government looked at doing was, uh, going into the, how you build finger, spits, uh, finger spitching of fuel and trust. Um, when it came to their training, they focused very hard on a couple of core missions that played to the strengths of their aircraft. They had um, one of their, uh, their main fighter aircraft was the Brewster, which was obsolete at the time. Um, it was not, not as fast, not as heavily armed as the things the Soviet Air Force or the, the Red Army Air Force could put up with them. Um, but um, it, it did have a couple of strengths that they played to. It had uh, um, it had lots of good speed in a dive, right? So um, you could you could gain a temporary speed advantage depending on your attack trajectory. Um, was not very heavily armed, but what did they do to, to compensate for that? They made good aerial gunnery a priority in their training. So not as many guns, not as powerful, but they were really good at aerial gunnery. Um, they also uh, in, in terms of building up that, that trust down at the individual level, they had a doctrine of see first, shoot first. So depending on your air force, like the shooter might be the senior person in your flight and your less experienced people you put off as like your wingman to, you know, one kind of protect them, but to, um, just kind of keep them out of the way of, you know, the real gunners, right. They didn't do that. They said, if you see it, we are going to trust that the training we gave you, um, you will put it to good use. You go ahead and get the kill. That lets you have that lets you have a higher tempo. That lets you keep initiative. If and if anybody can possibly break off an attack, now the Soviets can't be like, well, it's only dash one who's going to go in for the attack. It could be dash two or it could be dash three. You don't know. That's now injected uncertainty into their own uh, their own defensive procedures. Um, they had uh, uh, talking about the messaging and narrative after the war kicked off. There was a, a pretty public um, sort of public relations campaign that as the Soviets started bombing cities in Finland, it uh, the, the the message was sort of put out from the Finnish government. This is what the Soviets are doing. This is barbaric. 
and that inculcated a lot of sympathy. Unfortunately, not a, not, not a lot to sort of add more than moral outrage, but the point was they used a message to bring attention to their plight. And, you know, just like cockroaches under the light, right? Bad, bad actors don't like the tension. Um, so that still made the, still made the, put the Soviets in a bad position in terms of the strategic narrative. Um, what else we have here? Okay, so th those are some of the, um, the key things here. Uh, and actually a, a last, uh, last point was in terms of trust, the, I, I, as a, in my own background um, as a helicopter pilot, like we, we got a really good relationship with like our maintenance folks who keep the actual aircraft flying. And so what I sort of saw in the, in the winter war was a lot of these aircraft were put out into very austere conditions with very, with very limited supply support. There was a lot of trust placed on those on the on the maintainers to keep those planes flying under really really hard conditions, um, and they did. You know they were able to generate sorties to continue to to go out go into the attack when they could, um, and I think that's that plays into the six day war as well. But I think the you know talking about aviation stuff um, maybe it depends on your community or or your your nation's air force. I don't know, but I've I found that. A lot of times the people who keep those planes actually in the air don't get the credit they deserve. And uh, in, at least in, in my community, we, we know how hard those men and women work to keep those planes flying. And when they say an aircraft is ready to go, I believe them. Um, and it, it seems sort of simple, but like that trust only builds over time when they have proven again and again and again that they can fix aircraft to a high standard to be mission capable. When you're troubleshooting on the flight line, you know, you're, you're up in the cockpit and they know, they know more about the systems than you do. And you're like flinging stuff around and you're pissed off because you haven't gotten out of the chocks yet. And they come and they fix it and they get you get out. And you do that enough, that builds a really powerful uh, trust that is its own, its own enhancement to your combat effectiveness, the tempo of your squadron. So that kind of builds into, uh, builds into the six day war here. So I'm, I'm gonna start with that piece, the, how the maintainers, um, gave them an advantage. So the, the maintenance conditions were not austere, but one of the, the, the planning approaches the Israeli Air, For Air Force took in preparing, as it sort of seemed clear that they were about to get um, attacked from multiple sides, was um, focusing on rapid turnarounds, right? Like, I don't, I don't need to do a full, like, you know, nose to tail inspection. I just need to do enough to, to regas it, um, get it back flying. Regas it, get it back flying. Regas it, put bombs on it, get it back flying. Um, for anyone who knows, like the the depth of maintenance inspections, that's assuming a fairly large amount of risk. The longer you don't do like nose to tail inspections of your aircraft, the higher the chances some bad is going to go happen, and then you can't fly that aircraft. Um, well, they they focus their uh, their training on doing really rapid turnarounds, and the ability for their air crew or their maintainers to do that again and again builds trust. That when the pilot comes back. Five minutes later, maybe more than five minutes, but the pilot comes back, quick turnaround, uh, maintainer says you're good to go. They launch them out of there. They, they know that they're good to go because they have, they have developed that habit pattern of being able to do that over time. Um, going back to training and mission, again, sort of like the Finnish Air Force, focus on essentials. Um, you know, what, what were the essentials in terms of the Israeli Air Force? Uh, numerically, they had far fewer aircraft. So, one of their core essentials that they, they focused like a laser on was get air superiority right away by killing their planes on the ground. They can't swarm you in the air if they're all dead on the ground. Um, and so that, that sort of laser, that laser focus with their doctrine, um, as well as a good appreciation, just like the Brewster for the Finnish Air Force, what can, their, what can their planes do? What can they not do? A lot of Israeli Air Force aircraft were fighters and attack aircraft. So they would focus on, um, on suppression and destruction. Damage the runways, suppress the runways first uh, using your smaller fighter aircraft. And then you, I'm sorry, using your bombers with the heavy weapons. And then you send the fighters in to strafe and blow up everything on the ground because it's easier to destroy a fragile aircraft um, with fighter ordnance. Um, you don't need to spend your heavy stuff on that. So understanding what your aircraft are optimized to do. Um, they, they accepted a significant amount of risk to ensure the focus of that main thing. And that goes, this ties back into the, in the, the trust that those first waves would get the mission done. And the risk I'm talking about is that part of the, the operational plan for this, it was called Operation Focus. Um, I, don't, I think I left that out. But the initial waves, 
basically left Israeli airspace, air, airspace undefended. They were committing basically everything to go and knock out those runways, knock out those enemy aircraft on the ground. To a certain, if depending on if, if we didn't know their doctrine better, we would call that almost a reckless gamble of leaving yourself completely bare. But they trusted in the training of their air crew and their maintainers to get the planes in the air and do the mission. Um, they trusted in the proficiency of their, uh, they trusted in the turnaround time that they could actually do it when crunch time came. And that trust paid off because they were able to, to do just that. To, they, they were able to strip their airspace, do the mission, and not suffer catastrophic consequences back in their rear. So I think we kind of uh, hit the main points I want to get to there. So now we're going to go into ISIS and the nagorno karabakh war, and then we're going, going to go into Ukraine. So this is where uh, the strategic narrative I talked a little bit about with the Finnish Air Force. This is where I saw in the ISIS and the nagorno karabakh war where the message, where messaging started to be used as a complementary weapon to the air power in itself in a very deliberate fashion. Um, so looking at, uh, in both cases, we had uh, the, it was not the emergence of a new technology because, you know, I know at least the U.S. Air Force or U.S. military has been flying and other militaries have been flying drones for a fairly long time. But what we first saw with both ISIS and, and this conflict was what some have called the democ democratization of air power. I can get a really cheap drone now that can do a thing that used to take a multi-million dollar aircraft and a really expensive human pilot with lots of training to go do. That means I can uh, I can take people with far far less training and if I have far fewer resources, I can still do air power, thanks to the proliferation and the the the, the commercialization of drones. Um, this now become you know talking about that that delta between different competitors. Now your smaller competitors can close that delta because of this new, uh, the proliferation of this technology more widely. Um, and the other part of this and, and the strategic narrative part comes into here is not only do these these smaller actors are they're able to have they get more air power for less, uh, which brings them up to a higher level of capability. They both waged a very deliberate messaging media campaign to show not only do we have drones that are doing cool things. I'm going to show us doing it and I'm going to show how good we are at doing it. And I'm going to show you the enemy. You can't stop me from doing it. And the idea that you can't stop somebody from coming to hurt you or kill you is a huge undercutting of morale of that, that nebulous, those intangible things we, we led this off with. Um, it's uh, it, it's, it's soul crushing to know that you can't fight back. And if you do that enough, that is going, that gives you, that fear, that uncertainty, that that like self protection that becomes your main concern, that weaves its way through the organization and makes them less effective without having to drop another bomb um, or use another drone. It acts it acts for you as a corrosive factor against your adversary. If you can if you can tie the weapon and the strategic narrative together effectively. Um, yeah, and so this uh, this brings us to. I, I had, like I said, I had thought that the the uh, nagorno karabakh war was the the maturation of this. You know, maybe a year ago that was right. It's wrong now. So I'm going to bring us up to speed on where I think the maturation of this is going. And I'm going to do this with uh, an aspect of strategic narrative. All right. So a few videos we're going to watch here. So that's one angle. That was uh, a Ukrainian Mi-24 helicopter attack behind Russian border against uh, one of their oil refineries, which uh, is uh, it's pretty remarkable. And then. Right, and there are the Ukrainian helicopters getting away clean. Now, first of all, the guts on those pilots exiting that mission is just tremendous. Um, because one of the big things going into the war was 
the huge disparity between Russian Air Force and Russian Air Defenses and Ukrainian Air Force. Nobody in a million years would have thought uh, Ukrainian Air Force would have been capable of this. Nobody thought that Ukrainian Air Force would exist at this point in the war. And here they are several weeks into the conflict. Not only does the Air Force still exist, they're conducting operations behind enemy lines. They're going into Russian home territory and blowing stuff up, which as a, as a message, as a morale boost to your side, as a grand ideal to your side, and an absolute morale crusher to the Russian side, that's huge right there. Because uh, all, the, all the Russians who lived in that neighborhood there just got a real close personal lesson. Uh, you know, the, our, our mighty military didn't do a damn thing to defend us. Ukrainians got in, blew up stuff, and got away clean. They should never have been able to do that, all right? That now raises fear, uncertainty, and the confidence of those people, of the Russian military able to defend them. It raises, I, I'm sure it raised internal questions inside Russian air defenses of, how did you let these two get in and get out and blow that stuff up? How, how did you? You know, you have, you have air defense systems that uh, Ukrainians just, they don't have. You have more of them. Um, we've been, I know from the, you know, the U S side, at least Russian advanced air defense systems are like the stuff of nightmares for us. Um, because we just assumed that if you were, if they were out there and they were integrated and working the way they were supposed to, they would kill you. They were just absolutely deadly. And, uh, it would, if you, you would not fly into them into places that, that you knew that they were defending. Ukrainians just did that. Um, so there's a. Uh, so there's a that's a that's a messaging narrative aspect in there as well. Um, but to me, that was not like that's not the maturation of all of this. Um, that was this one. Anybody seen that video before? No? Yes. Yeah? yeah? OK, most of you know. Um, so first of all, uh, uh, so that is, that's Snake Island, which if you remember from the very beginning of the war, that was the island that the Russia, that the Moskva rolled up to, told them to surrender. They said something to the effect of no. Um, and then they got, you know, we, we thought that they all got killed, but they were, they were likely captured and said, but they were sort of pounded in submission. Um, well, now the Moscow's at the bottom of the Black Sea. And what was a, uh, I, I assume the Russians intended to turn that into a strong point as part of their larger air defense um, network around the area to help sort of blockade Odessa and have better effects over, over that part of the battlefield. Just like the Heinz, you had Ukrainian aircraft go in, do what they wanted to, and go out. So if we left the music out, that in and of itself is a, uh, and oh, by the way, a drone is filming this whole thing completely, like completely unbothered. So Ukraine, like a, a slow drone with no self-defense is just watching while two um, bombers are going in and doing whatever they wanted to, to what should have been a stronghold. You know, if it was a key part of the Russian anti-air def air defense system there, they should not have been able to do that, um, right? Um, anything else in before we get to the music? Any thoughts on like just kind of what you saw in the attack there? How they did it? It's an uh, extremely low level flying for being an uh, attack. I would say. I, I assume they're going low level, pick up, drop their bombs, drop some flags, and then go level yeah. to avoid uh, being shot down by yeah. enemy aircraft. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I took away from that as well, right? And this plays to um, knowing what your aircraft can do and what the adversary can do, right? You don't have a lot of aircraft, so you can't hazard them at an altitude where they can be intercepted going in there. 
Um, but if you trust, if you know that you've trained your pilots to the degree that they can go wave top level nighttime, by the way, wave top level nighttime, um, you saw how close those two were, right? Like, I, I'm not sure what optics they have, but any kind of night flying or close to each other, it always makes me a little bit nervous. Um, especially, I've never flown through Dash 2's hits or Dash 1's hits, but um, Dash 1 did its thing and Dash 2 was right behind, basically flying through the impact of Dash 1 to deliver its own ordinance. They executed it rapidly, um, safely, as far as we can tell, both aircraft got back. They hit exactly what they wanted to. And that, that whole sequence um, to include the flares shows a pretty high level, uh, pretty good tactical training because that's what you would do. Get in, pop flares in case anything's left alive on the ground so that you can get back out. So this message in and of itself speaks, one, your, your, your strategic narrative. Ukrainian Air Force, well, it exists. Again, it's pretty effective for when, when it is chosen to be employed and it's being employed very judiciously. Right, we don't see a lot of their actions on the airfield. They, because they they want to, they have fewer planes. They want to preserve that force, but when they do use it, they they use it judiciously on high value things. They're going to show you them using their aircraft. They're going to show you that not only do they still exist, that they can be very effective. You Russia can't stop them, um, but elevating to the next level of that strategic narrative of not just undermining your adversary, but getting people on your side to help you out. Anyone know what that song was? That song is called Hey, Hey, Rise Up. It was written by the band Pink Floyd in Ukrainian as a morale booster um, for the Ukrainian people and to bring more attention to the Ukrainian cause. So now you have not only, you've got a tactical strategic message, but now you've got people coming onto your side um, of their own free will, doing things to help your message more, to draw that contrast between who's fighting for the good thing and who's fighting for the bad thing more. And to me, this is just a, a microcosm of what we've seen the last two and a half months in just how incredibly effective a good strategic messaging campaign can be when you can, when you can define what your grand ideal is that you're fighting for and when you can draw a really strong contrast to what your adversary is doing, you know, their cause is bad and they're acting like monsters on the battlefield. That's a huge contrast. But even if, even if you had that, if you don't have a good messaging campaign, it might not do a lot for you. Um, their messaging campaign, I would argue, has been one of the most effective really since we've seen sort of prolific digital media. And I think it's working, right? Like I know that, that my government has just, <laughs> we have given in military aid alone more money than some nations have in their entire defense budget. Um, and that's just, that's just us, right? You know, there's a lot of other nations here in Europe who've contributed significant amounts. Um, that is, and that is largely because of a, a extremely effective grand ideal, a messaging campaign that is effectively tied to things going on on the battlefield to, as Boyd would say, to get those people on the fence, you know, at least they don't go on their side, but if you can get them on your side and keep them away from the adversary side, you have made your whole, your position that much stronger. Um, and it has nothing to do with the, you know, the size of your military. You, you get them stronger in lots of different ways. Uh, and I, and so now I think, um, really hope we don't have another war that makes me ask if the maturation has gone even higher, but this is sort of the, what I think is the, the, the maturation of, Boyd's concept of strategic narrative and grand ideal and how that is such an effective multiplier for your military forces on the battlefield um, here. This is sort of the microcosm of it right here. Yeah, perhaps a coincidence, just looking at the date, just the night before the victory day as well. So perhaps a coincidence. Yeah, so. That would be a strategic message as well, I suppose. Yeah, I, so I think that's the date the video was posted. I think the date of the attack was a little bit earlier, yeah. but uh, it's, I mean, I mean, the, the date, though, is still whether it was a week before or the day before, we're two and a half months into this war where we all thought the Ukrainian Air Force would be dead and Russia would have complete air superiority and Ukrainian Air Force is doing whatever it wants to and Russia can't stop it. Um, and when they try and stop it, they lose warships against a nation that doesn't have a Navy. Um, so all of those aspects are and are, are part of a and again, if if. Ukrainian government, Ukrainian, um, you know, political, military leaders, if they were not able to effectively use 
this this the sort of raw data for their messaging, maybe we wouldn't have all you know lots of sanctions. We wouldn't have tons of military aid. But they combined the data. They combined their 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 military effectiveness, their cohesion as an organization, with a extremely effective campaign of this. Not only are we are we good, are we fighting well, are we fighting for a good cause? I can show you. I can show you over and over and over and over again. I can show you from the tactical level right here, all the way up to the strategic level of, you know, civilian bodies being pulled out of villages that are being executed. There is a cohesive messaging campaign going on there, which speaks to a very, uh, I think, a high level of, of media and messaging intelligence that in contrast to the Russian side, you know, they're still, they're still pushing stuff, you know, like George Soros and Hillary Clinton make biolabs in, in Ukraine. And like, we're supposed to believe this stuff at this point, right? Contrasted to stuff, to stuff like this. Um, so I, I, just, I, I spent a lot of time on this, but I want to sort of, I want to tie all these things together and then get into questions here. So to me, this is the maturation of what we, what all those other case studies kind of feed into and how, how Boyd's doctrine, um, is tied into small state air force, small state air power today, like up to this minute, pretty much. And and what are those things that um, you know that that uh, that really tie it all together? It's the focusing on essentials. What what can your aircraft do? What can they not do? Um, what can your people do? What can they not do? Know what those things are. Trust them to do the things you know that they can do, and and keep the focus on the things that they are capable of doing. Trust them to do it. Building up your your organization's ability to do that, building up your orientation, your fingers, your fingers spitting good fuel, building that trust before the war starts. Ukrainians didn't pull us out of, you know, pull it out of the rear end at the last minute. The Russians didn't invade and they didn't suddenly figure out how to how to effectively employ smaller numbers or they didn't figure out how to trust, you know, their their privates and lance corporals taking video of tank turrets flying off on the battlefield. And then using that for national messaging that didn't happen overnight um that happened i i can't point to a specific date but i know that a lot of people have talked about how after the annexation of crimea they took that as a lesson and they changed they trained they did things differently because they knew they had to do things differently so they were this moment this one minute video here they were getting ready for it minimum eight years right so to have this level of effectiveness to encapsulate those concepts of void you don't start the day before the war starts. You have to have already done that and established those habit patterns well in advance. As you know, and as the Russians are finding out, there's been a lot of talk of, well, we'll see them adapt on the battlefield to these losses and things like that. I don't think they will. And it's because they have absolutely no habit. They have no, they have no organizational culture to make those changes. To you, you can't flip from a top-down military approach to bottom-up trust overnight. You just can't. And I don't, and they can write down all the lessons learned from the first two months of the war they want to. Their culture is not, their organizational culture in their military is not capable of taking those lessons and doing anything with them. Because that's not, that's not how they've been trained. That's not how they've been organized in the years leading up to this. They're fighting the way they've been trained and organized. And you can't flip that overnight. Um, acceptance of high levels of risk, which you can do because you trust your people to do those things. Um, and you've seen them do those things as you built up their own finger spitching your fuel, built up their decision making habit patterns um, in that whole pre-war lead up and all the preparation you've done going into that day, that second. And then finally, using effective strategic narrative and grand ideal to take your tactical military actions and make, make them impactful far beyond the actual tactical value of the attack, right? Like they've, I think... The Russians and Ukrainians have been going back and forth on the, the buildings and the missile systems on Snake Island for a while. Is Snake Island going to win the war for either side? You know, probably not. This is not a decisive piece of terrain from a tactical perspective. From a messaging perspective, every time they do this, this becomes an enabler for the Ukrainians and it totally undercuts um, and any, any confidence the Russians would have that they can use this island for anything. You know, far outside the inherent value or not of that, it's like 11 square miles. Um, so, and and that's the point. It's to show that you are. It's to it's to show how much you trust your people. It's to show how good your people are, how effective they are, um, and it's to show those things in contrast to the deficit your your adversary has in those things. 
And that's, uh, that's the end of my prepared comments here.